Well, thank you very much, Father Hathaway, and uh, thanks to Alex and the others at this parish who put together an event uh, in the midst of the pandemic, no less. It's good to be with people physically, again, exchanging ideas and, and talking about things that are important for all of us. The last time I was here, as Father said, I spoke about some, a subject that very few people knew anything about, which was basically the, where the church stood at the end of the 18th century, and a lot of people were agitated about. And tonight I'm going to speak about another subject that very few people know anything about and that a lot of people are agitated about, which is namely Christopher Columbus. Now, um, I want to apologize on behalf of Alex, because he may have gotten some of you here on false pretenses. I'm not going to give you a full-throated defense of Christopher Columbus, because not everything that Christopher Columbus did was defensible. It was a different time than ours. It was a very difficult set of circumstances that he came into. So I'm not going to... Um, what I'm going to try to do instead is something that I think is much more important, and that is to lay out truths, truths about our past in America that we all ought to grapple with. And what I'd want to just say at the outset is, even if Columbus was idealized in the past, I think that what's happening now is he's being demonized, and demonized unfairly. So what I want to do is just lay out some of the history for you. Uh, you can make up your own minds and go and read into this. You can read my book. There are many other very good books. But most of what's been happening right now has been operating virtually in a vacuum without any knowledge of the facts, without any recognition of what human history is like, which is to say it's a mixture of both good and evil in various ways. I'm, not also, I'm also not really going to give him a Catholic defense. I'm going to try to defend parts of what he did um, in just terms of truth. And I will also, by the end, I hope, bring in some points about the Catholicity that will be of interest to you. Uh, but I want to emphasize again, what we want to really do and not only about Columbus, but about many of the other issues that are agitating us right now, is to try to get ourselves informed and to follow the fullness of truth as much as we are able to discern it in our past and in our, in our present, and then to engage with one another in discussing what those truths mean. Now, that said, we're on Catholic premises tonight, and so what I want to also emphasize is that it was extremely important, supremely important, eternally important that Columbus helped bring Christianity to the New World. Now, these days, a lot of people don't think very much about Christian evangelizing, but I think that Pope Leo XIII, who is the, was the founder of modern Catholic social doctrine, had this pretty much exactly right in an encyclical he wrote in 1892, which was the 400th anniversary of the first uh, Columbus voyages. It's an encyclical called uh, Quarto Abionte Seculo. It's worth reading, actually. Leo allows that, that uh, although Columbus sought personal gain and glory, he also believed, as did many people then, and many of us still think this today, that ambition both for glory and, and for profit, is often a spur to achievement, that these are not simply evil things to be denounced. He characterized Columbus's most monumental feat, the crossing of the Atlantic, something no one had ever done before and been able to return to, to Europe. Um, he, uh, he, he characterized this as um, carried out under divine inspiration, which is what Columbus himself believed. I'll get into that before we're finished tonight. And he asserted that Columbus brought Christianity to, and here I'm quoting, a mighty multitude, cloaked in miserable darkness, given over to evil rites and the superstitious wor worship of vain gods. Now, to many of us, this, is a, this kind of attitude sins against ecumenism and denigrates indigenous cultures, and it certainly is a very strong critique. But if you believe as a Catholic, and I'll go into some of the details later, if you believe as a Catholic, and you should, that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, 
and the way that leads all nations and all cultures out of their bondage to sin and death, including our own, this matters a great deal. It matters a great deal that Columbus brought Christianity to these shores. And there's much historical evidence, which I'm going to get to, to be brought to bear on that question. But first, I'm going to give you a bit of a spoiler, because I'm going to give you one of my main conclusions. Um, my new book is called Columbus and the Crisis of the West because per perhaps more than any other figure, the way in which statues of him were torn down after the death of George Floyd, ter a terrible thing that happened, and the protests that followed shows with what I regard as almost a suicidal impulse within our own civilization. And that's why I call this a crisis. And it's here I think that some other Christian virtues become very important for us. Our civilization believes that all human beings matter because we are made in the image and likeness of God, a phrase that occurs in the first pages of scripture, in Genesis, obviously. I know of no other civilization that has ever taught that, never been built on the same principle. When I was here in January last year, and we were talking about those uh, last years of the 18th century when this parish was founded, I talked and, and tried to emphasize that our founding documents our Declaration of Independence speaks about men have, having been endowed by their creator with rights, not by one another, not by government, not by some cosmic evolutionary process, but by their creator. That is our foundation as, as both Christians and as Americans. Lincoln did the same thing in the Gettysburg Address because this was deep in our culture. You remember that, that um, Lincoln talked about uh, four score and seven years ago, uh, uh, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Created equal. They don't just become so by, by, uh, by politics, by being born in a certain country, or being b evolved from primordial slime. Now, of course, that truth did not just immediately take charge of our Western history. It took a long time. There were many... Uh, clashes in between the, the statement of that truth in the Bible and what we now come to understand as a far more inclusive sense of what it means that all of us are created equal. And we've got a long way ahead of us still to go to fulfill that Christian and Western vision of hu what human beings are. So anyway, I just bring this out early on because it matters a great deal both in secular and in religious terms, that we not lose touch with that heritage, that we not lose touch with the fact of a Western civilization that for all its flaws, and there were many of them that were in Europe before the, the Americas were discovered and then came to the Americas with, with uh, Europeans. Nevertheless, it's that basis on which even right now we criticize things in our own tradition. And if we lose touch with that, on what basis are we going to be able to advance what we believe to be the vision of human beings under God. Now, I think that it's precisely on this basis that somewhat justly now, people have begun to j criticize Washington and Jefferson for being slave owners. It's a terrible thing that they were. They were uneasy about it themselves. And um, I, I think it's only fair also that there is some criticism of Columbus as well for his failings, which I think were much less than than being a, a slave owner. I'll get to that. <clears throat> Nevertheless, all these people were great predecessors whom we honor not for their sins, but for the great things that they did themselves and that for the great things that they now enable others of us to do. The, the, the many ways in which we, they made possible for us freedoms that we now, now enjoy, goods that we now enjoy, including the freedom to criticize and to improve what needs criticizing and improving in our society. And that freedom, I believe, is under threat. And I mean this in a very concrete way. I'll tell you an anecdote. On October 12th, 1992, when I had written my earlier book about Columbus, because I'd seen so many things that were being said that simply were, were uh, if not exactly falsehoods, one-sided presentations of history, on the 500th anniversary on October 12, 1992, I gave a lecture at Princeton University with about 150 people present, making many of the same arguments that I'm making tonight. I gave a lecture, 
was an academic setting. Some people disputed certain points that I argued. Others reinforced them or developed them. Afterwards, we all adjourned, and I walked away unmolested. That could not happen today. I, I could not lecture at, at Princeton because I would be protested, shouted down, canceled, as we often hear it said. At that time, I was able to, to speak about my book at probably close to two dozen colleges and universities, and the same thing. The same thing happened. We engaged in a, a respectful discussion. We've gone backwards in our commitment to truth and freedom since then. We don't seem to be able to engage one another and have differences of opinion without it resulting in shouting matches and, 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 and virtual anathemas flung at one another. So I have two main concerns about the way that Columbus is now being viewed. First, I think he's being made into a symbol of our Western and Christian civilization. And not the best aspects of that civilization, but the worst aspects. Instead, many now see him as the root in, on these shores in the Americas of racism, slavery, colonialism, capitalism, environmental destruction, and more recently, white supremacy, white privilege, patriarchy, cisgender oppression, heteronormativity, and I could go on and on with all these, these uh, alleged offenses that someone like him represents. That's a lot to load on a single historical figure who existed 500 years ago. And what I often do when people, people start this um, argument is I say to them, look, just wait a second. If you're going to blame a figure like him, actually overgeneralize and, and accuse without digging down into the historical facts, if you are going to blame him for everything wrong that's gone on in the Americas since 1492, lots has gone wrong. Are you also going to give him and people like him credit, maybe even just a little credit for all the good things that have happened, all the things that went right since 1492? I'm still waiting for an answer about that one, by the way. My second concern is that these kinds of judgments, which I, I again believe are wild overgeneralizations, are being made with great passions in almost total ignorance of the history of the early explorations. Some people say to me, for example, I hear this a lot because, because people know that I've, I've uh, researched Columbus and written a fair amount about it. I actually kind of got dragged into this controversy. It was not something that I ever thought I would write a book about. But people come to me all the time and they say, my kid was just in school the other day studying about the early years of uh, the European explorations and came home and said, Dad, Mom, Columbus was a genocidal maniac. Those two words. <clears throat> now, they become a kind of a mantra in American educational circles. And I've got to say, this is largely due to the influence of one figure. Howard Zinn, who was a, a kind of a Marxist, uh, inflected historian, who regarded the whole history of the West and of the United States as a, a history of exploitation, of, of racism, uh, of subjugation, it's colonialism, imperialism, et cetera. And that's been a, a text, a, his text, A People's History of the United States, has been used for probably about 40 or 50 years in schools. And it's no wonder that people believe that Columbus was a monster, because that's the way he, he's portrayed there. Now, I just want to say this. No credible historian, no unbiased historian, believes that Columbus carried out a genocide. So the idea that he was not only, he had not only committed genocide, but was, was a genocidal maniac, as if he was doing this everywhere he turned, is just preposterous on its face. However, it is true that large numbers of indigenous people died after the Euro first Europeans arrived in the Americas, 85% of whom have never seen a so-called white man due to disease. This was a, a tragic circumstance waiting to happen no matter who arrived in the Americas first. You know, I, I often hear from people, too, that indigenous peoples did not need to be discovered. And in a way, that's true. But they did not know about the rest of the world, and the rest of the world did not know about them until Columbus and the, the uh, historical movements that he started 
discovered them. And I think it's not too strong a term to say this. Now, we're in the midst of a pandemic right now. We're in the midst of a pandemic that came out of China. And if in 1492, instead of the Europeans arriving in the Caribbean, the Chinese had arrived in, say, I don't know, Peru, they crossed the Pacific and arrived there, this same tragedy would have occurred. Millions of people would have died. And I want to emphasize, most of them never had even come into contact with Europeans because the, the viruses were spread by the wide trade networks that existed. You know, we, we tend to think that indigenous peoples in 1492 were kind of in, in these jungles or forests and, and very simple. No, there were widespread trade routes and, and, and goods being exchanged. And that is largely what, what transmitted those diseases that led to so many deaths after the first European voyages. We can hardly call this anyone's fault. And we, we certainly shouldn't attribute this to Columbus or others as a kind of a just genocide, just a, as an aside. The other thing that I often hear is that Columbus was worse than Hitler. Of course, this is, you know, what else is, are people going to say? There's a certain generation of people who can only find, uh, find a, um, uh, something evil if it's compared with Hitler, who's undisputedly evil, who killed 40 million people, including 6 million Jews, which re actually was an effort at genocide. There's nothing in the historical record remotely like this, and it's hard to conceive how it could have happened. I mean, how could you kill, you know, you're talking about a very small number of Spaniards, even much later, who had uh, a few muskets and, and some swords and, and were not ever in a position to, to kill large numbers of people. They did kill people. They did do things that we re regret that they did, they, they, they did now, but nothing on the scale that they're being accused of. These sorts of, of, of historical charges are ideological exaggerations that don't belong in a public discussion. They, 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 they belong in, um, in sort of political cells, radical political cells that don't engage in the kinds of patient, calm, truthful engagement that we all have to, in, in, have to be um, carrying out in order to be a responsible people to the past as well as to ourselves. And I, I'm sorry to say that I'm, I'm starting to feel that that is the only way that Columbus and other figures are being looked at, who are not exactly congruent with um, certain ways that people think we ought to act now. When I saw those young women stamp, stomping on the Columbus statue out in Milwaukee, my heart sank. And I don't blame them, because they, they've never been taught anything else. They've been taught in these extreme terms to regard him as an utter monster. And so it's not surprising, but there's, we have to do something about this by informing ourselves better and being willing to dig into things that are even uncomfortable for us at this point in our history. So that's what I'd like to do now. I'd like to dig into some of this history. And I hope as a means of mitigating a little bit this overheated crisis, um, which is not only a crisis about Columbus. Now, we don't have a lot of time to go into detail in a, a single lecture like this. And so if you want a fuller picture, you could buy my book. Uh, or you can read other books. There are other very good books. There's a, a um, Spanish-American historian, um, Fernandez Armesto, Felipe Fernandez Armesto, who's a very good biographer of Columbus and knows actually the whole, that whole period of the age of exploration. Um, and there are many, many others. I mean, I, I, I drew on those people in my own book. And, and I think in better days, that would be the mainstream of how we would talk about the, the history of the Americas. But even a little bit of history, and a little bit of real truth at this point, will go a long way for explaining to, explain to us why we can actually celebrate some of the figures of our past, like Columbus, even as we hold them responsible for bad things that they did. And I think that Columbus, perhaps more than any single other f figure in our history, has made it possible for us to be here and that deserves at least some gratitude on our part. Now, let me start off with a phrase that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's often been used to describe Columbus's motives. God, gold, and glory. Okay? I mean, if you haven't seen that phrase somewhere, that's regrettable, because it really does kind of sum up what he wanted to do. I'm going to hold off on God to the end, because there's complexities that I can only treat then. But what was Columbus seeking when he was crossing the Atlantic? Okay, 
yes, he was seeking profit. He was seeking a commercial, he was trying to set up a commercial enterprise. At the end of the 15th century, when he first set out, Europe was in an expansive mood. That's something that a lot of contemporary radicals deny. They tend to look at Europe in that period as wanting something and therefore reaching out and trying to exploit other peoples. Some of you are probably familiar with this New York Times 1619 project, and the woman who founded that has said precisely this, and I think was taught by the same kind of radical views that I've described already briefly. In 1492, Michelangelo was alive. Raphael was painting. Europe was in the midst of what we call the Renaissance. I mean, this is just the simplest historical fact, right? It was not a poor, grasping type of culture. It was an expansive culture, and it was part of that expansionism that led people to begin exploring. It was a mood of exuberance and of confidence that they had at the time. Columbus himself was a kind of bridge figure. In his religious dimension, he was late medieval, and we'll see how that is. In another dimension, he was a classic Renaissance figure. He actually corresponded with Paolo Toscanelli, who was a mathematician and an astronomer who lived in Florence, Italy, and Toscanelli's mathematical work enabled the Florentines to build that beautiful Duomo, if you've ever been to Florence. I was a Fulbright student in Florence, and I always used to marvel at that, and it was only years later that I learned that it was in the 15th century because of this mathematician, Toscanelli, who corresponded with Columbus, that they knew how to work out the mathematics to build that cathedral. Toscanelli had the view that the distance across the Atlantic was shorter than other people believed, and he and Columbus went back and forth on this, and it was part of the reason why Columbus thought he could do what he could do. Now, Columbus was a very experienced sailor, and lots of people try to denigrate that about him. I think he was an extraordinary sailor. Many others do as well. He'd sailed in one fashion or another the entire Mediterranean. He's from Genoa. That, too, is a fact that's often disputed, but I think it's beyond question that he was from Genoa, which was one of the great maritime powers along with Venice in the 15th century. He'd sailed everywhere from Chios in Greece through the Straits of Gibraltar, down the shores of Africa to the, the um, colony at Elmina. He probably also ventured out to England, to Ireland, and maybe even Iceland. So he had seen a lot, and, and then also the Atlantic Islands. <clears throat> so what was he up to? He was trying to open a new trade route. As we know, he was seeking a, a western path to the Indies, which at the time were almost a kind of a mythological land of spices and exotic uh, uh, goods and, and whatnot. The experts in Spain, mostly religious figures, told him that it was too long a, val a, a voyage to make across the Atlantic by sailing west, and they were right. They were absolutely right. Even Toscanelli was wrong about this. But Columbus persisted for other reasons, partly involving what he, what he thought were religious inspirations, that God himself was urging him to do this. Nevertheless, I want to make clear on this point about the God gold, gold and glory. Gold simply did not mean a kind of exploitation. It certainly didn't mean gr pure greed. What it meant was global commerce, pretty much like what we have now. He thought he would be sailing to a, a rich old civilization, a powerful old civilization, and his initial intention, if I can kind of put it this way, is he thought he would set up a, a trading post. That was the, the initial uh, impulse. And this is important because we can say from the outset that it was not his intention to engage in the slave trade or a conquest of the Americas, as is commonly claimed by certain types of historians these days. And by the way, slavery, colonialism, imperialism, etc., including torture, cannibalism, human sacrifice, were all a present in the New World before he came here. They, they were not brought by Europeans. They existed here. They were, were brought in different forms at times by Europeans. But it was nothing new. 
One of the things we've learned by actually studying indigenous peoples is that they were extremely varied in how they interacted with one another. Columbus actually stumbled into you know, various military operations between one tribe and another, even in the Caribbean, where the, the, you didn't have the, the high um, uh, imperial cultures like the Aztecs or the Incas or something else. Those relations were, were um, skewed in the same ways that we tend to criticize Europeans for now. And I'll give you just one example. The Caribs, which was a tribe in the Caribbean, who were um, cannibals. Cannibal is actually a corruption of the term Carib. The Caribs used to raid other tribes all the time. In fact, they kidnapped so many women from other tribes, and then they sequestered their women along with the Carib women, that the language that the Carib women spoke was Arawak, which was the language that the Tainos, the tribe that Columbus first discovered, spoke. And he was allied with them, in, or parts of the Taino tribes, for a large part of his, his uh, early history in, in the Caribbean. So imagine that. Imagine women speaking a different language than men in the tribe because there was such a large presence of, of women who had been kidnapped and then enslaved. Of course, great empires like the Aztecs and the Incas and others did things like that on a much, much grander scale. And even things like slavery among indigenous peoples existed for a very long time. Chief Seattle, who gave his name to the capital of, is Seattle the capital of the state of Washington? I mean, my, the nuns from third grade would kill me for this, I can't remember. Is, is it Spokane? Is it Spokane? Olympia, there we go. So we have people of, with historical knowledge and geographical knowledge here. So Chief Seattle, though. Uh, whose name gave the name to the city of Seattle, was himself a slave owner and a, a Indian warrior who you could kind of say committed genocide against other Indian tribes because he would wipe them out. He was a great warrior and that's how he became a great leader. Later in his life, he also became a Roman Catholic. So I guess we've got to take some of the blame for, from him along with uh, the other side. But he was also a great man. There are many facts like this about the, the, the uh, crossing of various cultures in this period and, and, and for centuries afterward as well. And it gives us an important perspective because if Columbus's first interest was trade, he thought he was going to Cathay to China, right? Um, it was only later that he realized that there wasn't very much to trade in the Caribbean. I mean, we've all heard these stories about when the Indians wouldn't bring small quantities of gold that their hands were chopped off. There seems to be some evidence of that, uh, how much Columbus was involved in that. Because it, it doesn't seem to me that he was. I think he was a very different man than, than that. But it's very clear that when he was forced to change his initial goal, which was to set up a trading post and, and also to bring Christianity to the New World, and that he had to set up instead an agricultural colony, he was absolutely terrible as a governor. Now, he, was a great, he was a great sailor, a great navigator, a great explorer, but on land, he was an utter disaster. And I don't think it was, he was a disaster because he was by nature a violent man. He wasn't a man like Cortez or, you know, God forbid, even Pizarro, who was a, I think was a psychopath. I think the best evidence that we have shows that he actually was, he was a bad governor because he would be indulgent, with both Indians and with the Spaniards, and then when things would get out of hand, he'd be, he'd be overly uh, harsh in punishing them, both, uh, punishing both indigenous and Spaniards. And that, of course, did not lead to good governance on an island like Hispaniola in those early days. The best witness we have about this matter is Bartolomé de las Casas. He's the Dominican priest who, to this day, is famous as being the defender of the Indians and who actually knew Columbus personally over many years. Uh, Las Casas was utterly tireless in seeking to have the Spanish monarchs pass laws to protect indigenous peoples, and he succeeded in doing that. The problem was that the laws at, at the great distances that were involved were simply almost impossible to enforce. And when you had, especially as you had more rapacious and greedy people begin to follow, thinking that it was easy to get rich in the Americas, um, it was very hard to control what was happening. Nonetheless, the Spaniards did pass laws 
trying at least to protect indigenous peoples. And Las Casas even was able to inspire an encyclical by Pope Pius III, which came out in 1537. It's called Sublimus Deo. So let me just read a kind of a long passage to you. Indians and all other people who may later be discovered by the Christians are by no means to be deprived of their liberty or the possession of their property. Even though they be outside the faith of Jesus Christ, they may and should freely and legitimately enjoy their liberty and possession of their property. Nor should they be in any way enslaved. Should the contrary happen, it shall be null and of no effect. By virtue of our apostolic authority, we declare that the said Indians and other people should be converted to the faith of Jesus Christ, preaching the word of God and by the example of good and holy living. Now, in spite of that, we know that that encyclical too is not very effective in stopping abuses in the New World. But some important terms had begun to be set down, and Columbus himself was engaged in trying to figure these sorts of things out. There began to, uh, to occur in, back in Spain and in Rome and, and in other places. Theologians and philosophers began to reflect on these new peoples. And if you, you ever read a history of international law, this is included there. It's very little known, especially in English-speaking countries, but it was figures like Las Casas, Francisco Vitoria, who was a, a, a Thomistic philosopher, who began these, the, the very principles of international law that we still are elaborating today. And um, even though it was later the British, the British Protestants who succeeded in stopping this, the slave trade and then ultimately, um, I, I think it was, it was largely later Protestant Christians who were able to overthrow the system of slavery in the world, largely, these Spani early Spanish thinkers and explorers also deserve some credit for what began to happen. Now, Las Casas is sometimes accused by some strict historians of exaggerating Spanish misdeeds so, so he could make the point to the, the Spanish uh, monarchs and to, to Rome. But his opinions about uh, Columbus were quite steady. He criticized some of the things he did, some of the harshness that we, you know, we, we hear about. But he spoke about the explorers, and here I'm quoting, sweetness and benignity of character. And even while allowing for the things that he did wrong in trying to handle these situations in the, in the Caribbean, Las Casas said that they were done out of ignorance, ignorance of divine law and misunderstanding of the situation rather than malice. And he said, and I'm quoting here, truly, I would not dare blame the admiral's intentions for I knew him well and I knew his intentions were good. There's confirmation of this in, in Columbus's own documents. Uh, in a moment of what I think regard as self-knowledge on his part, he wrote back to the Spanish king and queen, and he was begging them to be careful about who they allowed to come to the New World because he was having a heck of a time dealing with Spaniards even before we began to talk about the, the indigenous problems. And I want to quote a, a rather long part of, of this um, letter that he wrote back to him. Details really are quite interesting. Our people here are such that there is neither good man nor bad who hasn't three Indians to serve him and dogs to hunt for him, and though it were perhaps better not to mention it, women so pretty that one must wonder at it. With the last of these practices, I am extremely discontented, for it seems to me a disservice to God, but I can do nothing about it. Nor the habit of meeting, eating meat on Friday and other wicked practices that are not good for Christians. For these reasons, it would be of great advantage to have some devout friars here, rather to reform the faith in us Christians than to give it to the Indians. And I shall never be able to administer just punishments unless 50 or 60 good men are sent here from Castile with each fleet, and I send there the same number from among the last and the insubordinate as I do with this present fleet. Such would be the greatest and best punishment and least burdensome of, to the conscience that I can think of. Now, Columbus was, has been accused of many things, during the, the, especially during this third voyage. Uh, allegedly, a large number of indigenous killed, casual acceptance of slavery and rape, and much more. I look at the historical record, and I see passages like that in his letters, and it seems to me that these charges, though sometimes credible, are, are the evidence for them is weak, weak, 
or exaggerated. And in fact, there are other indications as well, rather than the, the uh, ideological attacks that try to heighten uh, those negative elements. In that letter, you can see very clearly the sincerity and his desire to reform a situation, the Christianity of the Spaniards, to reform that, which he could not control, he says. Indeed, his worries about conscience and his indulgence toward those people, sending them back rather than executing them or something, actually created an anti-Columbus faction back in the Spanish court, which came back to haunt him. Now, he also sent back indigenous peoples. He, this was not a massive slave trade. Indigenous peoples could only be um, enslaved it, under two circumstances, according to not only Spanish law, but mostly European law at this time. And it was not anything like the Middle Passage that happened to African uh, people who were enslaved, which was horrifying. Um, there were just not th those kinds of numbers being sent from the Americas to, to Spanish. The two circumstances, although things we would not countenance, are somewhat understandable. One is when you captured people in a, um, in a battle, what do you do with them? You don't have modern prison systems. You don't have uh, the ability to, to hold them uh, so they don't harm the community. Either you kill them, which of course is objectionable, or they're forced to be servants. And that's what, what happened in, in one part of this, um, this situation. The other was there were certain tribes, I mentioned the Caribs and cannibalism, who Spanish law and European law would allow to be captured and restrained because it was a, a, a serious violation of natural law. Now I want to say again, we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to apply that quite that way now. Um, even back then, the Spanish moralists knew that there would be settlers who would abuse those two exceptions. But you can see why un under difficult circumstances, something like that might actually happen. <clears throat> I think you have to be aware of all this when you, sp you begin to read some of the criticisms of Columbus. Did he kidnap people and take them to Spain? Yeah, maybe he did. Maybe they decided they wanted to travel with him there. We do know that some of the first uh, Tainos, the tribe that he was allied with, who went back with him to Spain, uh, some returned with him and he released them so that they could explain you know, what they had seen over in, in, in Spain. Was he harsh at times toward the indigenous? Yes, in ways that we would not countenance now. But to me, the best balanced um, interpretation of these things is that like many people who have found themselves in unprecedented circumstances, and if you've ever been in circumstances like this, you have to sympathize, it's not easy to know how to handle them. And I think that's why Las Casas would not press the point of the things that he had done wrong, knowing that what he was trying to do was right, but it wasn't right the way he tried to do it. <clears throat> and by the third, end of the third voyage, Columbus himself knew it. He, uh, he himself was sent back to Spain in chains and forbidden to go back to Hispaniola, which is the island that, that has the Dominican Republic and Haiti uh, in the Caribbean. He was forbidden to do that, even though he was allowed to continue his, um, his exploring. I want to talk a bit about his achievements as an, uh, an explorer, because today I think we're, you know, we take these things for granted because we have jets, we fly to Europe in five or six hours, uh, if you're on a boat and you get into trouble, you pick up the satellite phone or you, you call the, the helicopters and you know they come and rescue you. I actually walked out onto a reproduction of the deck of the Santa Maria, which was the largest of the three ships that Columbus uh, sailed in that first voyage. The Vatican in 1992 had a Columbus exhibition in one of its museums. And you went through these curtains and you parted them and you stepped out onto the actual deck, a re reproduction of the deck of the Santa Maria. And man, it was small. It was about from here to maybe 10 pews back. And crossing the Atlantic in a little ship like that without um, modern technologies was really something to have done. Felipe Fernandez Almesto, the historian uh, and biographer of Columbus, who I mentioned earlier, I, I think um, gives a a really beautiful, brief summary of the things that you have to look at in, in, in what Columbus did to just uh, be able to carry out physically that voyage. I'm going to quote from him. His decoding of the Atlantic wind system, 
he somehow knew that if you took a more southerly route, it would take you west, and a more northerly route would take you east. It was very easy to go out into the Atlantic, but coming back, of course, was, it was going to be the most difficult thing, and he solved that. <coughs> His discovery of magnetic variation in the Western Hemisphere. He came here, and without high-tech instruments, he knew that somehow the, mag the Earth's magnetic field varied when you got into the Caribbean Sea. Um, his contributions to the mapping of the Atlantic and the New World. His, um, his aperçu about the imper imperfect sphericity of the globe. When he was sailing along the Venezuelan coast, just on the basis of, of the primitive instruments that he had, he realized that the Earth actually bulged at that point. This is something that modern scientists have confirmed. The Earth isn't a perfect sphere. It has, it, it, it's irregular in the way that it, that it, uh, it, it lies. Fernandez Armesto says, any of these would qualify an explorer for enduring fame. Together they constitute an unequaled record of achievement. This is one of the reasons why one of the main Spanish historians in the 16th century said about him, it was the greatest event since the creation of the world, excluding the incarnation and death of him who created it, the discovery of the Indies. That's um, from Francisco Lopez de Gomara. Now think about this too. Vasco da Gama, who was a Portuguese explorer, went down the African coast and actually did reach the Indies, which brought great wealth into Portugal. But there's a reason why Vasco da Gama has never had the kind of celebrity that Columbus has. And I think it's this. He already, he went to visit peoples and trade with peoples who are already known. And reaching the Indies, as great a feat as it was, just didn't compare with the fact of a person discovering an entire set of new lands and peoples the way that Columbus was able to do. And realize what this meant. This meant that for the first time, people understood that they lived in one interconnected world. As I said earlier, you know, at, at the 500th anniversary, the term that was used was not discovery, it was the encuentro in Spanish, the encounter. Because people didn't want to privilege either the indigenous or the Europeans, and so they, they tried to talk about an encounter of cultures. I think that there's something to be said for that. But Columbus connected people as they had never been connected before, and that is the beginning of the one world that we all live in right now. It, it made a, a tremendous uh, revolution in, in, human, uh, in, in the human understanding of what the world is. Uh, my friend uh, Cardinal Francis George, now dead, used to say that th he was struck when there were pictures taken of the earth from space, that it really gave us a sense that we all are living in one world. I think that you could make the case that we really began to have that mentality in 1492 when for the first time people realized that you could explore the entire globe and that there was actually going to be interaction between people everywhere. Now, I'll give you a bit of a lighthearted example of what this actually meant. And this came out, Newsweek published a special issue in uh, 1992 about Columbus at the time of the 500th anniversary. And they had one article by um, the former food critic of the New York Times. His name was Raymond Sokolov. And he wrote about the culinary uh, consequences of Columbus. He, he said that um, all of us now, Europeans and A Asians, Africans and Native Americans, all eat far better than because the globe had been united. Western technology exponentially has increased the availability of food. We have more food now than we need to, to feed 7 billion people, much larger population than it was back in 1492. And then there's the variety. Chinese adopted peppers and hot peppers and peanuts from the New World, which were unknown at the time. Europeans uh, grew fond of peppers and, and, and uh, peanuts along with tomatoes, which were thought to be poisonous in Europe, corn and potatoes. Potatoes saved Ireland in, in, during the famine. Native Americans now enjoy ch chicken, pork, wheat, various other delicacies. So in a book that he wrote about this subject, Sokolov decided that 
He, he, he experimented with a pre-1492 menu, both European and, and American menu, which had unappetizing concoctions like dry bread crusts and pond scum cheeses and demonstrated how much better it was for all of us that there has been this global interaction that Columbus began. <clears throat> but we're on Catholic premises tonight. And we've talked a bit now about the gold and about the glory. And I want to conclude by looking at the, re the specifically religious dimension of Columbus. Religion was a very important motive for Columbus. He was a deeply religious man, became even more so the older he got. And he believed that the Holy Spirit had inspired him to make these voyages. Now, whatever we think about this now, you, you can see in the, the, um, the, the large number of documents that he left behind describing this, that he was quite sincere about it. And there's also another fact. He let, in his will, he actually left money from the St. George uh, Bank in Genoa for the recovery of the Holy Land, of the freeing of Jerusalem from, from a Muslim invasion. This is a long, of course, history that involves crusades and whatnot. And whatever we think about it today, one thing we can say is he put his money where his mouth was. He was very sincere that the, the uh, world should be uh, evangelized and that um, Christianity was important to bring to, uh, to other peoples. There's a whole literature about Columbus's spirituality. And I'd like to just point to one document that he left to us. It's called his uh, Libro de, la, de las Profecias, the Book of Prophecies, which he compiled near the end of his life with help from the Franciscans. Very few people know this, but, but Columbus used to dress like what was called an Observantine Franciscan, very strict um, uh, segment of the Franciscans in his later life when he was in Spain. So he wrote a letter uh, as an introduction to Ferdinand and Isabella in his, in his book of prophecies about how he came to conceive of this, this uh, enterprise of going to the Indies across the Atlantic. And let me quote to you. During this time, I had searched out and studied all kinds of texts, geographies, histories, chronologies, philosophies, and other subjects. With a hand that could be felt, the Lord opened my mind to the fact that it would be possible to sail from here to the Indies, and he opened my will to desire to accomplish this project. This was the fire that burned within with me when I came to visit your highnesses. He was seeking financial support, obviously. And he adds that God wished there to be a milagro evidentissimo, a very evident miracle, very conspicuous miracle in this enterprise. He says he studied a lot on, on his own. He was, he was a sailor, but he was actually a sailor who read books. And he concludes with this. He says, for the execution of the journey to the Indies, I was not aided by intelligence, by mathematics, or by maps. It was simply the fulfillment of what Isaiah had prophesied. Now, that's kind of an odd thing to say. Was it, did Isaiah... Isaiah prophesy 1492, but Columbus actually thought that there was something in the prophetic tradition that had indicated this pathway. And when he mentions a hand that could be felt, we know that he took this almost literally because there are points when he, he actually hears voices. Some people think that this is a psychological disturbance on his part. I wouldn't be so quick to judge that. I think that God inspires people at times to do things that maybe even they don't know they're being asked to do. If you look at the apostles, the apostles were told by Jesus many times that he was going to die and rise from the dead and whatnot, and they didn't get it, and they were his handpicked, you know, 12 uh, assistants. But whatever we can say about this, we know that from other writings of his that that was part of his inspiration from, de from a decade before he ever set out to cross the Atlantic. So we have to take that seriously, and I think we need to take seriously the fact that um, Columbus himself all his life, a, a, a Catholic, but it, in, in this particular enterprise was carrying out something that he th thought God himself had called upon him to do. And he really achieved something in this realm. I'm going to have to speak some hard truths about this, but it's common ver now for various jurisdictions. Here in Fairfax County, this has just happened as well. It's, co it's common for jurisdictions to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. 
And I have nothing against celebrating any culture, if we know what we're celebrating. We don't just uh, kind of do this out of political cor correctness. But consider this for a second. Why does one have to replace the other? Why can't there still be a recognition of how important those voyages were? And with all the complexity and the glory and the horror of it, still, how important that is to our history, to the fact that we're all sitting here tonight, we can still honor that and at the same time become truly inclusive and begin to look at other ways to honor other um, segments of the, the Americas that have been overlooked or even repressed in the past. The fact that we're, we replace one with the other, to me, I think, re reflects something that is deeply, deeply disturbing. It means that we're really turning back against ourselves and rejecting our own culture in, in a way that's quite dangerous, and especially so, as I said at, at the outset, because what other culture do we have that is going to say that we're all made in the image and likeness of God? Other uh, experiments have been tried, Marxism, fascism, communism, and they don't turn out so well. If you think about this for, for a second, we, we don't really need to replace. What we need to do is to amplify. And I want to talk about a, a, very, a couple of hard, hard cases. Um, the Mexican poet and Nobel laureate Octavio Paz, who's now dead, I believe, had a fascination with indigenous cultures. He was a Mexican poet, you know, he, he would find ruins of, of uh, Indian temples and pyramids and whatnot. It really moved his imagination. And he wrote a long poem called Piedra del Sol, Sunstone. You've ever seen the Aztec calendar? It's like a round stone with you know, the markings on there. It's how they kept track of the time. It's a beautiful thing. I've seen it down in Mexico City. Paz described the, the Mesoamerican Meso Indian culture as a world of city-states perpetually at war with one another under the leadership of kings who proclaim themselves divine. Now, a lot of anti-Western um, commenters glibly kind of write off this as European culture was a culture of death and you know, Europe was needy and, and came here and exploited. Some of the high Indian cultures, such as the Aztecs, the Mayas, even the earlier Olmecs, the Toltecs, and many more were guilty of, they were really openly cults of blood and death, much more so than anything in the old world. Here's how Paz describes the religious foundation of the Aztec Empire and, and Mesoamerican religion in general. The religious foundation common to all the Mesoamerican peoples is a basic myth. The gods sacrificed themselves to create the world. The mission of the human being is to preserve the universal life including his own, feeding the gods with the divine substance, blood, human blood, by the way. This myth explains the central place of sacrifice in Mesoamerican civilization. Thus, war is not only a political and economic dimension of the city-state, but a religious dimension. If you've never seen Mel Gibson's movie Ap Apocalypto, you, you could get a, a very graphic idea of what Paz has just described there. Another Mexican literary figure, Carlos Fuentes, he's a novelist, um, no friend of Christianity, no friend of the United States of America. But in 1492, he wrote a very interesting book called The Buried Mirror. And he says, See, look, it's true the missionaries who came to Mexico, they accepted the encomienda, which is not exactly slavery, but it's Indians are brought into settlements that are directed by the Spaniards. And it was a way to kind of organize these societies that are starting to mix with one another. And he says, yeah, OK, they, they did that. The encomienda was supposed to be a responsible way to take care of indigenous peoples as well as the Spaniards. Of course, given human nature, it often turned into exploitation. But Fuentes says about this, even if the missionaries did accept that that had to be the way that uh, the, the missionary enterprise could be carried out. And something similar happened in California, by the way. The, the controversy over um, St. Junipero Serra is basically over the same thing. Should there have been an encomienda type uh, organization of, of Native Americans and Spaniards? Nevertheless, here is what Carlos Fuentes says about Christianity coming to Mexico. One can only imagine the astonishment of the hundreds and thousands of Indians who asked for baptism as they came to realize that they were being asked to adore a God who sacrificed himself for men instead of asking men to sacrifice themselves to gods. 
as the Aztec religion demanded. Now, this of course does not absolve Europeans of the many bad things that happened during this integration process. But it does su suggest that one of the things that, that happened in this process that Columbus started, and as Leo XIII rightly pointed out, is that people who were involved in what we can only call idolatry and what he called evil rites were actually freed from this and freed for something different uh, that I think we all would applaud today. So let me close with an image of something that could have been more present in all of this and that I wish had been, but given human nature probably was impossible. It was present, but not, as it, not to the extent that it, it really um, it uh, prevented the clash of cultures that actually occurred. And what I mean by this is, um, I want to talk about the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. That image, more than anything else, was responsible for the Christian evangelization of what are now uh, uh, Latin American, Sp uh, Spanish, and Portuguese-speaking lands. It's a remarkable thing. That revelation, that appearance of her, changed the religion of, of almost two entire continents, something that's never happened anywhere else in human history. And there's one little detail about um, the, that image on the tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe that I, I think, uh, for me, symbolizes something remarkable. There's a four-petaled flower. She's, you know, she's pregnant, and on her stomach there's a four-petaled uh, flower, which some people think is jasmine, but uh, botanists seem to think that there's the jasmine actually has six petals and not four, but in any case, it was a flower that was quite significant for the Toltec peoples. Juan Diego was a Toltec. It was quite significant because it was the flower that was associated with the, the ultimate high god. He was the, the god above all other gods. He was so high and so inaccessible that human beings had no way to reach him. In the, in the Toltecan uh, theology, that, that God was powerful and transcendent, but inaccessible to human beings. People who have studied the image of Our Lady of Guad Guadalupe say that that four-petaled flower, however, said that the transcendent, all-high, inaccessible God was now there. That in Mary's womb, that God had, con had come close to those people. So indigenous peoples or, or Europeans, we have to recognize that quite an important thing, quite an important religious thing happened with the arrival of the Europeans as well. And I myself think that we ought to be grateful for the imperfect vessel, Christopher Columbus, who made that and many other things, good things as well as bad, possible on these shores. Thank you.